So give yourself a round of applause for giving hope to the world. <laughs> Because what's going to surprise you is that I know pessimism is fashionable in the world today, but I'm actually a sort of a member of an endangered species. <laughs> I'm someone who's very optimistic. So then I'll like try to explain my optimism to you today. So I'm going to divide my remarks into three parts. But I'm going to talk about the state of our world. So number one, what is the state of our world? Where are we really in terms of human history? Two, why are we so depressed? What's wrong? And three, what do we do about it? How do we make the world a better place? So let me begin by answering the first question. What's the state of our world? And here it's actually quite shocking how few people in the world, including, I dare say, some of the most well-informed people in the world, do not know that there's never been a better time to be alive as a human being. You know, in the last 30 years, and I suspect most of your lifespans are within the last 30 years, humanity has made greater progress than ever in human history. You are actually very lucky to be born and to be alive at this time. Now, some of you will be skeptical. So let me give you some data. As Yong Kwan mentioned from my latest book, Has the West Lost It? First piece of example of how the world is better. You know, I can tell you, for thousands of years, ever since the human species marched onto planet Earth, one of the biggest challenges has always been to create peace. And actually, wars have been a defining aspect of the human condition almost since the beginning. And what's remarkable is that we are living today in the most peaceful time ever in human history. And if you want data, this is what Harvard Steven Pinker, if you haven't read him, he's produced two good books, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and another book more recently called Enlightenment Now. I met him in Harvard a few months ago. And this is a quote from his book. He says, Today, we are probably living in the most peaceful moment of our species' time on Earth. And he adds that global violence has fallen steadily since the middle of the 20th century. According to a human security brief 2006, the number of battle deaths in interstate wars has declined from more than 65,000 per year in the 1950s to less than 2,000 per year in this decade. So your chances of dying in war are probably zero. And previous generations will say how amazing this time is. Now let me give you another example of the spectacular progress that humanity has made. Because just as we had difficulty eradicating war, we never succeeded, or we thought we would never succeed in eradicating global poverty. And here in this area, the progress has been even more remarkable. Now let me give you the data. In 1950, now, that's not so long ago. That's two years after I was born. In 1950, Oxford's Max Rosa says, three quarters of the world, 75% were living in extreme poverty. 75% of humanity. In 1981, it was still 44%. 
But by 2016, the research suggests that the share in extreme poverty has fallen to below 10%. Can you imagine this? From 75% of the world's population living in extreme poverty two years after I was gone, born to now less than 10%. And I can tell you, the good, one good aspect of my life, just it may sound strange to you, is that I actually experienced poverty. When I went to school at the age of six, the principal weighed me. He declared that I was malnourished. I didn't qualify for the weight. I was put on a special feeding program. I used to go to the principal's office. There was a big pail of milk, one ladle, 10 or 12 of us. The malnourished ones were given milk. And as you can see, I've gone from being undernourished to overnourished <laughs> in my life. But I can tell you that the most debilitating condition for a human being is to suffer poverty. And here we are, we are on the verge now of a point in human history where within 10 years, the number living in extreme poverty is going to go to zero. That's why future historians will say, wow, what a wonderful period of human history it was at that time when you're living now. And if you want another example of how the world is progressing dramatically, let's take the global middle class population. In 2010, maybe out of, out of 7 billion people, the number was 1.8 billion. By 2020, it's going to become 3.2 billion people. By 2030, and you'll all be alive, 2030, it'll be 4 point nine billion people. More than half the world's population is going to enjoy middle class living standards. Again, this is something we have never seen in human history. So let me just close with one final quote of someone from the Cato Institute, Johann Noberg. And this is what he says. Huh? If someone had told you in 1990 that over the next 25 years, world hunger would decline by 40%, child mortality would half, and extreme poverty would fall by three quarters, you'd have told them that they were a naive fool. But the fools were right. This is truly what happened. Remarkable times. But why? Why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen 70 years ago when I was born? Why this period? And this is, of course, a long and complicated story. Again, this book, I say that one of the reasons why humanity has progressed so much in the last 20 to 30 years has been the spread of what I call reasoning. And this is a gift from Western civilization to the rest of the world. I suppose you all know that the first civilization to take off, modernize, improve the living conditions of its people was Western civilization. Initially, they used that power to conquer and dominate the world. That's how the West colonized the whole world in the 19th and 20th centuries. But then they shared the gifts of reasoning with the rest of the world and the conditions in societies all around the world improved dramatically. And going along with the spread of reasoning was, of course, the spread of science and technology that went along with it. And it doesn't have to be sophisticated science and technology. It can be basic hygiene. And you know, uh, if you read another book recently, I was reading it re by a Harari called Sapiens, another good book to read. He points out there's a king of England, King Edward, his parents had 16 children. Out of 16 children, 10 died within the first year. Three survived beyond 10. And they all died by 50. Right? Kings couldn't live 
Today, infant mortality is the lowest it's ever been in human history, just through the spread of basic hygiene, telling mothers, wash your hands and your babies will be safe. That's a spread around the world. So as a result of that, we have this wonderful condition, human condition today, where humanity is progressing and doing better than it has ever done. So if that's the case, this brings me to part two of my remarks, why are we so depressed? What's gone wrong? So, I give a two-part answer to this question. Part one is that, sadly, the West, which is fundamentally responsible for the success of humanity, has now lost its way. And it's the depression from the West that is infecting the rest of the world. And the second part of the answer is that the world has also changed fundamentally, structurally, and we haven't adapted to it. So let me briefly explain the two propositions. First, how did the West lose it? And here, I would say that the one thing that happened, also interestingly, in the last 30 years, in 1990, I'm sure you're all aware of this, that around 1990, there was a spectacular development in human history. This was the end of the Cold War, and the Soviet Union collapsed. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, the West felt so happy and so triumphant. And a very famous writer, Francis Fukuyama, wrote an essay called The End of History, in which he said, ha, we've reached the end of history. The West has triumphed. The West is number one. The West doesn't have to change and adapt. The rest of the world must change. The West has arrived. And as I say, in a somewhat cruel fashion in this book. Francis Fukuyama's essay did a lot of brain damage to the West because he put the West to sleep at precisely the moment when China and India were waking up. And why was the waking up of China and India significant? It was significant because from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and North America took off. So if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2,000 years of world history, the past 200 years of world history have been a major historical aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end. So it's perfectly natural to see the return of China and India. But they decided to wake up at precisely the point when the West went to sleep. And as I explain in my book, the West clearly had to make structural adjustments to the return of the rest of the world, and the West didn't do so. And one concrete example, what happened in the year 2001, for those in the West, the biggest event that happened the year 2001 was 9-11, when Osama bin Laden sent planes crashing into the World Trade Center. And I was in Manhattan when it happened. I was there. I could experience the political shock of 
and the impact that it had on America. But it also had a disastrous impact in another way, because the United States then started fighting wars in the Middle East and didn't notice that something far more important happened in 2001, which was China's entry into the World Trade Organization, WTO. And when 800 million right, new participants enter the global economic system, there's bound to be creative destruction. Workers would lose their jobs in the advanced industrialized countries. That's what happened. There was a political backlash. And lo and behold, when the workers got unhappy in the year 2016, Donald Trump was elected. You see, it's all related. It's all part of a much larger phenomenon that is happening in this world. And if you don't get the big picture right on what's happening in the world, your society is going to suffer. And the West, which was the most successful civilization, somehow has got lost in the last two, three decades. And at the same time, another major structural adjustment is also has to be made by the world. And here, the one result of all the massive improvements in the human condition that have taken place is partly a result of us, the world shrinking, of us becoming a single, interdependent, global economy, global village, the world has shrunk, right? And when the world has shrunk, we have to adjust to it. Now, to understand why we have to adjust to it, I use a very simple boat metaphor to explain how the world has changed structurally. And what is this boat metaphor? I say that in the past, when 7 billion people lived in 193 separate countries, as you know, the 193 member states in the UN, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats. Each boat had a captain, a crew to take care of the boat, and you had rules to make sure that the boats didn't collide. That was the old order. But today, as a result of the world having shrunk, the seven billion people no longer live in 193 separate boats. The seven billion people live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. This is our global boat. But the trouble with our global boat is that you have captains and crews taking care of each cabin. But no captain or crew taking care of the global boat. And if you want to understand why your generation is seeing a succession of global crisis after global crisis, is because nobody is taking care of the global boat. So, you want examples? Look at the global financial crisis that happened in 2008, 2009, started with Lehman Brothers in New York. Wham! The whole world got affected. Look at pandemics. They can begin in a small village somewhere, and wham! The whole world gets hit by a pandemic. Look at terrorism. You have a few people sitting in Afghanistan, plotting and planning something, and the World Trade Center towers come crashing down in New York. You're in the same boat. And of course, the most powerful example of the fact that we live in one boat is this tremendous challenge of global warming. 
And global warming, as you know, is probably the biggest and most fundamental problem that we face as human species. Because it's going to create massive challenges for societies around the world. And one of the points that future historians will make as they look at our response to global warming, the simple question they will ask is how is it that the human species evolved and became the most intelligent species on planet Earth? And as you know, we are destroying thousands of other species because of our power over human Earth. And yet, the most intelligent species of planet Earth is proving to be the most stupid species of planet Earth because it is destroying the only Earth that it has to survive on. And this is something that will completely befuddle future historians and say, how could they be so stupid? You could, there's no other planet for the human species to go to. Why aren't you taking care of it? Right? And why aren't we? Because we are busy, to go back to my boat metaphor, taking care of our cabins and not taking care of the global boat. So therefore, this brings me to part three of my remarks. What is to be done? What do we do to take care of our world? Now in this book, as the West lost it, I offer a three-part solution. I call it the 3M solution. First M is minimalist. Second M is multilateral. Third M is Machiavellian. But today, I'm only going to talk about one of the three M's, which is multilateral. And I can tell you, as someone who has served as ambassador to the UN and who has spoken about multilateralism for many years now, the best way to put an audience to sleep is to talk about multilateralism. Global governance is such a boring subject. No one understands why it's important. So I hope I don't end up putting you to sleep in explaining why multilateralism is important. And I would say, frankly, we have no choice. If indeed we live on one boat, surely it's in our interest to come together and take care of this one boat that we have. We have to create, strengthen institutions of global governance, and that should be our priority. And frankly, the number one and most important uh, institution of global governance is the one represented up there, which is the United Nations. Right? And again, as an example of how stupid we are, right? This is the one organization that can give us a lot of hope for the world. But if you read the New York Times, if you read the Economist, you read the Financial Times, you read the Wall Street Journal, what do they do? Rubbish the UN. It's so fashionable. If you are a brilliant intellectual, you've got to rubbish the UN. That's how you show how clever you are. But actually that shows how stupid you are because there is no alternative to the United Nations if you want to save the world. And why? So let me explain what multilateral organizations, Exhibit A, UN, there are other examples too, how they save our world. First thing that multilateral organizations do is that they enable people from different parts of the world different cultures, different civilizations, to talk to each other. 
and to understand each other. And there's no way you can find a solution unless you talk to each other. And there's only one place where you can go and talk to each other, and that's the United Nations. And this is, by the way, true not just of global multilateral organizations, but also regional multilateral organizations. And since you are all here in Bangkok, Thailand, let me tell you that in this city, on August 8, 1967, Right? About 51 years ago, one of the most remarkable organizations in the world was born. And it's called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. And that organization is a miracle. Why is it a miracle? Because if you want to take one region of planet Earth, which is the most diverse, right? Out of 640 million people in Southeast Asia, you have 250 million Muslims, 120 million Christians, 150 million Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, you have Hindus, you have Taoists, you have Confucianists, and we even have communists in Southeast Asia. And guess what? The most diverse region of planet Earth has now become one of the most peaceful and prosperous corners of planet Earth. If ASEAN succeeds, it provides hope to a world which is as diverse as Southeast Asia. And you know, surely you know, that the level of trust between major civilizations, which should be going up at a time when humanity is becoming more and more educated, has actually become worse. You know about the political backlash against Islam, in so many of the Western capitals. You know that. So at a time when the world is shrinking, when different civilizations have to understand each other better, relations are getting worse. And is there hope? Yes. Look at ASEAN. How did ASEAN do it? And if ASEAN can do this for a significant microcosm, of the human species, that shows the power of multilateral organizations and why we must work to strengthen them if we want to generate better understanding in this world. What's the second thing that multilateral organizations do? They create rules, and the rules are the one that make the world a peaceful place. Now, I told you all at the beginning of my remarks that we are now living in the most peaceful time ever in human history. It also coincides with the launching of the United Nations Charter. And if there's one small document that if you can find to time to read, read the UN Charter. Very easy to read, small, beautiful. And what does it do? It delegitimizes war. It's the most powerful document created in human history that has delegitimized war. And according to the rules of the UN Charter, you're only allowed to use force if it's either sanctioned by the UN Security Council, which I once presided over, or if it's an act of self-defense. 
So, if it is not endorsed by the UN Security Council, if it's not an act of self-defense, it's an illegal war. And you want to exhibit? 15 years ago, in March 2003, the United States, UK, and a few other countries launched a war in Iraq. Right? Not endorsed by UN Security Council, not an act of self-defense. So Kofi Annan had to say, and he suffered a lot for saying it, the Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan said, well, then the war is illegal. Right? And the fact that the UN Secretary General would say that is because there's a document called the UN Charter that explains what makes wars legal and illegal. So rules matter. And only the UN can create rules that are mandatory and binding on all states. And what's the third thing that uh, multilateral organizations do? They provide, they play a very important role when things break down, when you need conflict resolution, when you need to bring together parties that don't talk to each other. So, there's one, one place you go to to solve these issues and challenges. You go to the UN or you go to other multilateral organizations. Now, I suspect some of you are skeptical, so let me give you some examples. Now, again, here we are in Asia, and I'm sure you know that things in Asia in general are going well, but from time to time we have problems, we have issues. And sometimes the two most powerful countries in Asia, in terms of the size of the economy, Number one, China. Number two, Japan. They can't talk to each other. I'm sure you know this. I'm sure you know the history of World War II, the Japanese invasion of China, the wounds it left behind, the problems it generated, and from time to time the incidents happen, and when incidents happen, the leaders of China and Japan can't talk to each other. Because if Japan goes to China, it's seen as a Jap sign of Japanese weakness. If China goes to Japan, it's seen as an act of Chinese weakness. So they have to find a face-saving way to talk to each other. And where do the leaders of China and Japan go when they want to find a face-saving way to talk to each other? They go to an ASEAN meeting. See? Because ASEAN not only organizes meetings among the 10 member states of ASEAN, it also invites all the great powers to come every year to attend the ASEAN ministerial meetings. And guess what? They all turn up. United States, Russia, China, Japan, India, European Union, they all come to ASEAN meetings. In theory, they're supposed to talk about their relations with ASEAN. In practice, they can also solve other problems. And this is why multilateral institutions matter a great, a great deal. And I can tell you, as someone who served in the United Nations twice, a lot of the work is done in the formal assembly rooms like this. You go in there, you listen to speeches. But as you all know, when you come here, an equally amount of work happens when you chat over tea, you chat over coffee, you chat over lunch. And people who find it difficult to speak to each other bilaterally. I can give you some examples. 
Israelis, Palestinians, Indians, Pakistanis, Greeks, Turks, many examples. You can't talk to each other, but you run into each other in the corridors and you chat. And quite often you get things happening as a result of these conversations that happen. And that too is another reason why you need multilateral organizations. So, if I am to conclude with one simple and clear message to all of you, the message is amazingly simple. Today, if you look at humanity, the leaders who are as old as me, the 70-year-old people, unfortunately, have become very cynical, skeptical, and dismissive of multilateralism and multilateral institutions. And if your generation inherits this cynicism, this skepticism, this dismissiveness, then you're going to have a very troubled future for planet Earth. But if you can go against the wisdom of your elders and tell them, you rubbish the UN, I will love the UN. And if you can do that, if you can be brave, and go against this conventional wisdom. And if you can persuade governments to give more money to the UN than to starve the UN in the way that they're doing, then possibly we may continue to have a great world. But as I said, it's all in your hands. Thank you. Based on your personal experience with the UN, both as ambassador and security council, do you have any specific examples of when you felt like you were creating a better world, contributing to a better world, and so on? Well, I, I, um, uh, I, I would say that, um, you know, in different times, we face different challenges. And when I was ambassador to the UN the first time, from 84 to 89, uh, we had to deal with two cases of significant violations of international law. Uh, the first was the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. And the second uh, was, uh, at that time, uh, Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia. And that's when the UN had to take a stand. Do we say might is right? Or do we say international law should hold supreme? And if that debate, and this debate took place in the 1980s, if that debate had taken place a hundred years earlier, in the 1880s, international law had no chance. Might was right. The powerful countries could invade countries, occupy countries, and get away with it. And for me, Exhibit A, is, and I say this, by the way, because I'm ethnically, I'm, I'm a Singapore citizen, but I'm ethnically uh, of Indian origin, and I can tell you that one of the great mysteries of history is how did 100,000 Englishmen ruled 300 million Indians effortlessly in the 19th century. Power, right? Power reigned supreme. You could do that in the 1880s. 1980s, guess what? The Soviet Union was the second most powerful country in the world after the United States. He thought its invasion of Afghanistan would mean automatically that they would, they would succeed. In the end, the Soviet Union had to withdraw. 
And one reason why it withdrew is that every year in the United Nations, the vast majority of countries, you know, over 100, 120 countries will vote for resolution saying, please withdraw from Afghanistan. Please withdraw from Afghanistan. And that, if you didn't have a UN, in the 1880s there was no United Nations, you couldn't send the message. In the 1980s, you could send the message. And at the end of the day, it worked. So, I mean, of course, there are many other reasons why it worked. There are also other geopolitical factors, but the international law dimension was clearly expressed uh, by the United Nations. And at the end of the day, that's also the reason why, as I say, wars are diminishing, and, and it's because of the work we do in the UN. You've spoken about the increased need to see the big picture mm. in terms of what is going on with the world. And you've also spoken in the past about the importance of critical thinking. Mm. Given the audience here, which mostly comprises academics, uh, those embarking on their first professional steps, whether one is in a formal leadership role or not, why is critical thinking so important and how can one acquire those skills? Mm. Uh, if I may give, if, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bit naughty and give you a facetious answer, okay, to wake you up. Uh, you want critical thinking? Read my books. <laughs> uh, the, I actually, one of the big benefits I had when I was young, the, uh, most of my classmates in Singapore were very practical, so they studied economics, uh, engineering, medicine. Uh, I decided to choose the most practical subject in the University of Singapore. Uh, the name of the subject is philosophy. And it turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Because when I became ambassador to the UN, I discovered that one of the challenges you face as an ambassador to the UN, just now you stood up, I was, you saw me giving a speech, right? I would give a similar speech in the United Nations. But as I spoke, the speech would be simultaneously translated into French, Russian, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, maybe one other language, I'm not sure, uh, simultaneously, you know. And sometimes I would say something in English, and then it would be translated into French, and the Russian translator didn't speak English, so he would translate from French into Russian. So can you imagine the language, how, what, what I say can get, get distorted as it gets translated into different languages. So I asked myself, how do I overcome this problem? And it's actually very simple. Use simple logic. Logic works equally well regardless of the language you speak in. Right? I mean, you know the classical uh, example all dogs are animals, Fido is a dog, therefore, Fido is an animal. That's logic, simple logic. Same in every language. So whenever I gave a speech in the UN, I had a logical structure, I used numbers, and the logic and numbers were carried into all languages. And that's how you make an impact across cultures. So you, and in your generation, you are actually going to be influenced more directly by people from other cultures and civilizations more than any other generation is going to be. So you've got to learn how to cross uh, cultural and civilizational barriers. So if you can use critical thinking to speak in simple, logical fashion, you'll find that your message will be understood by many different cultures at the same time. One more question for me, and it's actually through the Relief Web Twitter account. So thank you to Julie Hoff, Julie HPS 89. Her question is, 
Even if the proportion of people living in extreme poverty falls to 0%, won't that just create a new bar for the definition of extreme poverty? What about the factor of relativity and the distribution of wealth? Uh, I, I would say I completely disagree with that premise. Extreme poverty means, very simply, you don't have enough to eat, right? I mean, you, as I said, you probably never experienced it. But most of humanity, for most of human history, experienced extreme poverty. And as you know, there used to be famines. Millions would die. Guess what? It ain't gonna happen again. Nobody's going to die hungry. This is a, the most spectacular development in human history. Now, there are the other problems of inequality. Inequality is a challenge, but it's a very different challenge from dying of hunger or starving. So extreme poverty is about survival at the most basic level, getting nutrition, getting medical attention, getting access to education, what you all take for granted, most of humanity didn't have for most of human history. So the eradication of extreme poverty is a big deal. So you should celebrate it. Yes, we will have other issues, other challenges, but it's remarkable what we have done in terms of eliminating extreme poverty. Mm, after hearing your lecture, um, in the past, we used to think that you um, just express condemn after an event happened. But after hearing your lecture, I think can we understand in this way that you um, is more like an international um, legislative platform for leaders to meet and negotiate with each other on some important issues. It's about the UN and the role of the UN. Yeah, the function of UN. Okay. On the, on the, on the, what, on the, the question of 2016 elections, what can young people do and so on and so forth. I mean, my, my big advice to you is, uh, uh, number one, don't give up. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's very easy to, to feel that some challenges are impossible. You can't change anything fundamentally, and you, nothing you can do about it. That, that, that would be the worst thing you can do, because frankly, all previous generations of human history envy your generation, because you are the best of generation ever in human history. So if you become cynical, then clearly there's no hope uh, for the world. It's important for your generation to be far more, uh, uh, how do you say, determined to change the world. And if there's one big idea that you can all contribute to, by the way, it's a very simple idea, which is that, yes, we must defend our countries. We must make our countries strong. But we have an equally important obligation to defend and protect planet Earth. You have only one planet, right? As I keep emphasizing. So you must always think about the impacts of your actions on your country and how you can support it, but think of the impact of your actions on the world as a whole, on planet Earth, and what it means. So essentially what I'm saying is that your generation has got to learn the art of being a good national citizen and being a good global citizen. You got to wear two hats at the same time. And that's my point about the response to the first two uh, questions. And the question about the UN, I must confess, I didn't uh, get, I heard the line about is it just, uh, just a place where international legislators meet and, and uh, forge agreements? It's true, that's what the UN does. And give you one, a classic exhibit. Uh, as you know, there's more. Uh, a larger part of planet Earth is taken by oceans and a smaller part taken by land. And, and for a long time, we didn't have convention to regulate what we did 
in the oceans until we completed the Law of the Sea Treaty. Now, the Law of the Sea Treaty was negotiated over several decades in the United Nations. And finally, when the, they reached agreement, we finally had a set of rules that covered what we can or cannot do in oceans. But of course, the, the treaty is incomplete. As you know, uh, I can tell you, when you all reach my age, eh? I'm 70, eh? you will not be able to eat the varieties of fish that my generation could eat. Because there's so much overfishing in the world, fishing species are dying. You know that, it's happening. And you are not protecting these fishes. So we need urgently a convention to prevent overfishing in the world. So that's why you need United Nations. You negotiate a law of the sea treaty. You're now going to negotiate a convention on fishing and overfishing. That's why you need places like the UN. But you've got to work very hard to get it done because at the end of the day, it, these things only happen when there's strong political pressure to do so. And if you don't deliver the political pressure, nothing will change. So if you got to announce and say, our generation will not allow overfishing to take place on planet Earth, and we will push for it. And if you succeed, there will be a convention in the United Nations to make sure that that happens. What are your thoughts about, I guess, history repeating itself? Even though we are in the best time, we're going to move forward. How can we guarantee or know that? 40 years from now, 50 years from now, um, the next set of people are not going to think and believe in the way that we do. Good, good question, yeah. And then the third question uh, from the Relief Web Twitter, I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly, Suhas Puta, S-P-U-T-T-A 97. Uh, the question is, multilateralism only works best when all countries are transparent. Given the inherent... Uh, what, sorry? All, uh, multilateralism only works best when all countries are transparent. Oh. Given the inherent inequality, inequalities of the UN, veto, observer status, NGOs, how do you suggest that we achieve it? Uh, on the Iraq war, right, first question, and you said it's, it was illegal but it was still carried out and you couldn't stop it, you're right. But at the same time, the Iraq war, by your, for your information, had a profound impact on policy makers around the world. Because what they saw was that the United States, which is the most powerful country on planet Earth, and in fact the most powerful country ever in human history, no country has accumulated as much military firepower as the United States has done so. And guess what? It failed in Iraq. And when the largest military machine on planet Earth fails in Iraq, people will say, you see, military means no longer work. And therefore, people become more cautious about launching war. So it's not just the illegal uh, dimension that matters. People saw the results of the failure in Iraq too. And about uh, how to make the UN more attractive, unfortunately, that's not going to happen easily. Because as I said, my generation has been very cynical, very skeptical, very dismissive uh, of the UN. And unfortunately, it's the best liberal minds, as I said, of New York Times, Financial Times, who contribute to that cynicism. So you've got to fight against that uh, cynicism and actually say, no, I'm, going, I'm not going to be uh, Part of it, part of the cynicism. That's why I think it's important if you, for you all to have a positive attitude towards the UN rather than the negative attitude towards the UN, that's the conventional wisdom. And the point about history repeating itself, you're absolutely right, if that can happen. And if you ask me what I'm worried about today, I haven't spoken about my, many of my worries. Uh, and I can tell you that's the project of my next book, uh, which is that. In history is always di driven by the relations between the, the world's number one power and the world's number one emerging power. 
the world's number one power today is United States. The world's number one emerging power is China. And in the next 10 to 20 years, relations will become difficult. You don't have to be a geopolitical genius to predict it. Because when the number two power is about to pass the number one power, it's going to happen within a decade, then you get all kinds of challenges. So that's when history uh, might uh, repeat itself. And so you've got to pay attention to geopolitical issues and challenges. I don't see famines coming back, by the way, because we have enough resources today to take care of those kinds of issues. But the, the larger geopolitical challenges, that's when history may repeat itself. And that's where we have to be uh, careful. And, and, and someone, the last question about the vetoes, observer status and all that. And let me emphasize one important thing. Uh, I've spoken to you about how wonderful the United Nations is, but the United Nations is also one of the most imperfect organizations in the world. It is not, how do you say, it's got many design flaws, uh, it's got lots of problems, the veto is a challenge, although I actually think the conventional wisdom says we must get rid of the veto. But the problem about getting rid of the veto is that the veto entrenches the great powers in the United Nations. If you remove the veto, the great powers will leave the United Nations. So it's better to have the great powers within the UN family so that you can act to constrain them rather than have them leave the United Nations which is, by the way, what the United States did with the League of Nations a hundred years ago because it didn't have the veto power. So veto power is, is a negative instrument, but it's also a positive instrument. So when it comes to analyzing global geopolitical issues, it's important to be idealistic. It's equally important to be realistic because some aspects of great power behavior will not change. And so you've got to learn how to handle great powers, and therefore you've got to give them things like the veto to ensure that they remain in the United Nations. Uh, so you spoke of the UN's ability to create rules in the legislation. However, there's been criticism about the enforceability of those rules and the judgments in the courts, um, whether that is political rather than binding. What can be done to rectify this? Sorry, what can be done to? To rectify this, to create uh, binding judgments rather than just political enforcement. Sorry, again, I didn't hear that. Creating blind, uh, binding? Binding. binding. Like, the, the, um, the judgments made in the international courts. OK, good question. How, while we are facing a lot of um, opposition that we have this global vote and have had the same leader. What's your suggestion that we can achieve that in real life? So your suggestion for getting a, a captain of the boat? Yes, yeah. and how, what's your suggestion of how we achieve that in real life? Okay, let me quickly go through the uh, questions. Uh, how to make the judgments uh, binding? Uh, um, here, uh, unfortunately, the subject of international law is a very, very complex subject. I'm not a lawyer by training, by the way, but I can tell you the paradox about international law is that it is on the one hand very weak and on the other hand very strong. This is a great paradox, you know. It is weak in the sense that if a tribunal passes a judgment, let's say against a great power, it is not enforceable. I'll give you an example. The World Court uh, passed a judgment against the United States on Nicaragua. Uh, it was unenforceable. But at the same time, international law is very strong because it creates a climate in which countries comply with it. And one of the great paradoxes of our time is that in many cases, countries don't have to comply with international laws. But most of the time, most countries do so, which is why the world is so peaceful. So 
Therefore, I would say that my answer to your question is that even if they're not enforceable, keep reinforcing the international laws. Over time, they become self, uh, self-implementing. Countries decide, hey, I don't want to be a bad guy. I don't want to violate, be seen to be a violator. So countries also uh, get subject to peer pressure. And by the way, or for many conventions, uh, for your information, countries have to go to the United Nations every two to three years and report whether or not they, they uh, complied with international conventions. And that reporting process gets countries to focus on what they need to do to implement these things. So that international law does have some teeth even though you can't formally implement them in the way that you can f- implement domestic laws. So I say don't give up on international laws. Uh, on the global boat question on the, on the captain, and I, and I see in some ways it's very good to use simple metaphors like a global boat so you understand why a boat needs a captain and so on and so forth. But I can tell you that planet Earth is not going to have a captain. <laughs> It will not be run by a captain, it will be run by a committee. And if any of you have tried running committees, you know how difficult it is. Right? Getting agreement. I'm sure when you were trying to organize this meeting, your committees must have debated you know, who should speak first, who should speak last, etc. Et so, so running the world by committee uh, is going to be very inefficient, very difficult, but there's no choice. And you can't, you, there will be no uh, Superman or Captain Marvel or to come and be the uh, captain uh, of our global boat. So, but what, what you need to do is to create a global population that says, hey, let's manage our global boat responsibly. And you've got to create bottom-up pressure that will then result in having the kind of global governance that you need on top. But it's a very slow, painful, difficult process. And you've got to learn to be able to handle the difficulties if you want to improve uh, planet Earth. So that's also my answer to the last question about the captaincy of the boat. So, sir, don't you think that multilateral organizations sometimes act counterproductive to the United Nations in terms of decreasing their influence over a particular conflict? For example, South Sudan. So, the United Nations mission to South Sudan was deployed there, and they were supposed to keep peace there. But in terms of mediation, they were not involved in the mediation process, and African Union and IGAD plus IGAD were uh, conducting the whole mediation process. So on one side, the United Nations is trying to keep peace there, but they have no say in it. So doesn't the multilateral organization there decrease the, influ- uh, decrease the influence of the United Nations? And like South Sudan, we all know the state it is in currently. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah. What do you have Thank to say you. about that? A war is only legitimized by the Security Council of the UN. So since you know that there is a motion in South Africa, that uh, land which was forcefully taken from uh, black Africans in South Africa must be returned back or it must be expropriated without compensation. Let's say, for instance, that motion is passed by parliament and the people who are, who are owning the land currently and they are not the rightful owners deny or refuse to return back the land and we come to the UN and say that we want to uh, wage a war or a civil war against those people to bring back our land. Will you legitimize the land? Will you legitimize the war? You spoke about a lot of problems and you provided solutions, but I think you forgot to speak about the motion of maximizing profit that is causing problems in our world. For example, the problem with a, a, a the oceans and uh, the fourth industrial revolutions, those are man-made phenomenons that are caused by capitalists. So what is your view on that? Thank you. Uh, My name is Tenzin Fox, and unfortunately I'm a member of the country that in 2003 was part of the coalition of the willing that went into Iraq. 
And had I not been six years old at the time, I would have definitely, and not, you know, and had known what the UN was, I would have been the first to protest such a movement. But um, the war dragged on for so long, despite the UN uh, declaration that it's illegal, because primarily of monetary interests. Uh, oil companies, lobbyists, uh, weapons manufacturers who had power and sway in government and uh, used that to essentially prolong the war for as long as possible. And I look around the room at the moment and from what I've heard today, I would gladly live in a world or a society run by anyone here. But as you said before, we're one of the luckiest generations, but we're also one of the generations with the shortest amount of time. And we can't wait until we've gone to university, gotten several degrees, uh, done trips around the world and volunteered and then secured a position of power. We need to influence the people in power at the moment. And so my question would be, how do we break through the wall of fiscal and financial priority that those in power have put up around their morals? Thank you. Uh, as you can see, the first question is very long. <laughs> and my, my simple answer to you, you are reading out various development theories, okay? Now, you, if you get a bunch of six development economists in this room, they will all disagree with each other, okay? There are lots of development theories in the world, but I suggest to you, since you began by referring to Japan, I want to make a very important point here. Why is Asia succeeding now in the 20th and 21st centuries? Because Japan succeeded in the 1860s. It was the Japanese success in the Meiji Restoration that inspired the rest of Asia. And how did Japan succeed? Well, I, if you look at one of my books, The New Asian Hemisphere, I point out how Japan copied seven pillars of Western wisdom. So there are some basic things that have to be done by countries to succeed. And those basic things, there's an agreement on all of them. You know, like free markets, and as I mentioned, and so on and so forth. So you, but if you try to get the complicated debate on A or B and all that, don't worry. When you're trying to get from the basic uh, success or development, the answers are very clear. The second question is also a very difficult question. And I completely agree with you that there are established vested interests in the world that are very powerful, that have lots of financial resources, so, for example, I can tell you this for a fact. There is an industry out there that is trying to demonize and weaken the United Nations all the time. They're getting a lot of money, you know. The people who bash the UN get a lot of money. But that doesn't mean you give up the fight. Because I can tell you that one good piece about having lived as long as I have is that I have actually found that over time the right ideas do matter. And the right ideas, if you push them hard enough, they will succeed eventually. And so, so for example, I'll give you a small example. You're talking about overfishing, right? One of the areas where there's overfishing is because lots of Chinese eat shark's fin. Guess what? The Chinese Communist Party, which has 90 million members, banned shark's fin from its menu. Vroom. Millions of sharks were saved. The right idea eventually hits home and people then act on it. And you, to your, your point about, uh, I guess your question is about the imperfect. Uh, organizations, and it is, a, it is a fact of life, and I must emphasize this to you, is that the hard thing about life is that on the one hand, you have to be very idealistic. 
if you want to change the world. But at the same time, you have to deal with a very imperfect world of imperfect institutions and imperfect processes. And then still, despite the fact that they are imperfect in every dimension, continue to use them. Don't give up on them. And I give you even ASEAN, for example. I mentioned ASEAN as a great success story. I can tell you that ASEAN is the most imperfect organization in the world. <laughs> but guess what? The imperfect organization delivered tremendous peace and prosperity for 600 million people. So imperfect institutions can also succeed in the long run. So my final message to you is don't give up. Keep up the fight. But as I mentioned, I was very fortunate, unlike many millions of Syrians that haven't been and are still refugees. Um, the reason why I'm wearing this is because of the Assyrian um, heritage of mine, half Assyrian, half Arab. Um, the other thing is, and also this represents a, a, a nation that, doesn't, that is still stateless, that doesn't have a country, uh, which is the Assyrian, which are just diaspora of nation. Uh, that's why I also wanted to bring it. But anyway, just cut into the chase. Um, First of all, Professor, it's quite a privilege to have you. Uh, I want to thank you very much because you are truly an intellectual and knowledgeable person. No wonder there is a line of people asking, and there were a few people that missed the chance. But anyhow, I just want to jump to saying that I do believe in the United Nations. This is actually the words of the incumbent Secretary General. I do believe it because despite some people's rumors about saying there are not enough funds, so the discrimination, the shortages that are occurring and the restrictions happening from other countries uh, to fund the, the United Nations. Still, there are some solutions to, to, to solve that. I also uh, believe, despite that saying, the United Nations is not so implementing effective solutions like entrepreneurs, such as Elon Musk, for instance. There, I also believe, despite that some of them are saying there are not even some affirmative or resolving uh, decisions taken. For instance, there might be some biases to, to especially the US Security Council, and that to, to maybe um, please one uh, aspect, one, one side, and maybe not to, to anger at another aspect. I, I, despite all that, I do believe that we're not nations because if it wasn't for that, lot, lots of things that have uh, happened today in the world, refugees would have been more scattered in the world, some diseases like polo or other would have been eradicated. The UNESCO's work of, of preserving um, all of the monuments and historical uh, artifacts wouldn't have been uh, established and so many other things. On top of that, the world would have been in a, in a pool of fighting countries. So the United Nations does this beautiful medium of, of connecting everyone together. But, so please allow me. Now my second part of my question is this. When I'm looking, ladies and gentlemen, in this room, Every one of us in this room are, is very privileged. Um, we are of, of the few people that are so, so privileged to be here and, and in this entire building. We're selected like one of, one of a few. And the fact that I see so many people from richer countries and less people from poorer countries is not reflecting our, our current diversity of the world. So my question is, um, and just by the way, before I jump to that, uh, my main interest, why I came to, to this symposium, because I'm interested in, in sustainable development, and particularly in clean energy. And this is why I'm studying at the university. But why, what my question is to you, Professor, and also how we can solve this. When will the United Nations start to bring more youth from underdeveloped countries and give them the, the, a voice, because they are the ones that are witnessing the problems. For instance, in Syria, lots of my friends died while they're trying to wait for a visa, and no one was hearing of them. Many engineers, many, many, many uh, medicine uh, students, and other talented people, they lack the voice. And the United Nations has not been doing anything about it, with all the respect, because I've been following this up quite uh, uh, um, meticulously. And uh, it's not only when, how to bring those. Uh, I, mean, I, must, I must thank the questioner from Syria, and uh, I, I'm glad you made it to Australia. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a, it's, you know, Syria is one of those conflicts that is very complicated. Eh? And 
if ever you all, some of you may end up, right, becoming diplomatic negotiators and trying to solve problems like Syria, never underestimate the difficulty. <laughs> because Syria is not just a war between Syrians. Syria is a proxy war among great powers. And if you don't understand the interests of the great powers, you will not have a solution for Syria. So that's a tragedy that happens. And that's also why, by the way, the UN is so important. Because have you noticed how the number of proxy wars in the world, how many there were in the 1980s and 1990s during the Cold War, and how they have diminished significantly in the last, last 10 to 20 years. So for countries like Syria, there is actually hope that that will change. Over time, there will be less of such proxy wars. But you're also very right to talk about the many other contributions of the UN, polio, UNESCO, you mentioned too. Believe me, the UN is doing a lot of good work in many areas. I mean, like World Health Organization, uh, and I haven't spoken at all about the one organization in the world that I really admire a great deal and is actually responsible more than any other organization for the improvement of the human condition, which is the World Trade Organization. If you want to see a chart that explains why our world is doing well, look at the amount of global trade for the last 300 years, how it goes like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. And then after World War II, establishment of WTO goes like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. It's the explosion of world trade that has created prosperity for the world, and that's the World Trade uh, Organization. So I would say uh, we still have to keep on working with these organizations and keep on uh, strengthening them, even though from time to time they will fail, in, as you know, as they fail in Syria, as an uh, uh, example. And of course, Venezuela is another... Uh, your, your, uh, the other question about the, how you bring in the marginalized voices into uh, places like the University uh, Leader Symposium, I can tell you the one good thing about the United Nations is that every country has a voice. So even though I come from Singapore with a population of 5 million, I was given the same amount of speaking time as the ambassador of China, who had a population of 1.4 billion. So that's the advantage of the United Nations system. One country, one vote gives an equal voice to many countries uh, within the United Nations. Now, in the question of uh, Venezuela, uh, I, I mean, as you know, it is a fact of life. You all have some friends who are not doing well, some friends who are struggling. You also have countries that are struggling in the world, and Venezuela is one of the countries uh, that is struggling in the world. But let me just close, if you don't mind. We're going to finish now, right? Uh, uh, you mentioned that people in Venezuela now have to eat rats, if I heard correctly. You said times are very hard. You know, let me tell you a, a true story. A, a very good friend of mine, I won't tell you the country, went to a village in Southeast Asia, and the village had rice farmers, and they were all quite poor, actually. So when he went down there, uh, he was received well, and they said, we are so happy you came to visit us. We must give you a treat tonight. And they have this huge, what do you call it, mounds of rice, right? They go to the mounds of rice, a group of men carrying bats, uh, and they would hit the mounds on one side, Rats would come out the other side, then they would kill the rats, and they serve the rats to VIPs as a sign of luxury. So, you know, it, it all depends on the context uh, that you come from. So maybe from Venezuela, eating rats was a, a, a step on the way down. In some parts of the world which are poor, it's a step on the way up. So this is why 
we must continue to have hope and hope that we will keep creating a better and better world. Thank you.